Hello, and welcome everybody to Toastmasters Bay to Bay, speakers from San Francisco to Monterey. My name is Will Dinkle, and I will be your host for today's session. Today's session will be broken into two distinct sections. The first section is known as Table Topics. Now, during the Table Topics session, I will be inviting speakers up from the audience to give one to two minute impromptu speeches on a topic of my choosing. After Table Topics, we'll have a short vignette on our featured club, and then following that, we will have a prepared speech by advanced speaker Peter Kark. So for the table topics, I do get to choose the topic. And so the theme for today is summer vacation. Now, spring is over and summer is here. Now, sure, I know, summer doesn't technically start for another week. But anybody who's been outside in California the last week knows that summer is upon us. What do you think of? when you think of summer. Ice cream cones, trips to the beach, hot seats in your cars, and the best part of all, summer vacations. Now I'll be honest, being new to the workforce, I don't have a lot of vacation this year. But I am on this side of the podium, which means I will be telling you what to speak about today in Table Topics. And so today I will be living vicariously through you and enjoying my summer vacations through you. Now this past week, I was having a conversation with my friend about a particular Southeast Asian country. And at one point I said, boy, I'd really like to visit that country. And she said, um, well, it's on my list, but it's not number one on my list. And I began to think, what is on my list? What is the top destination on my list? And I would now like to invite up our first speaker from San Jose Toastmasters to tell us what is the first destination on his list. Please join me in welcoming Darren Penfield. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, I have always wanted to go to Australia. Australia to me is one of the world's paradise. All sorts of beautiful animals, beautiful country, beaches. I have always wanted to go there. I wanted to see the kangaroos. I want to see the koalas. I want to go on the interesting beaches. I want to go to Australia. But it's expensive to get there. And I've been told it's expensive to live there and to stay there. So I'm going to have to spend a little time researching how I'm going to get there. I'm going to have to look at my budget. I'm going to have to determine how much I can afford and when I can go. But Australia, I want to be there so bad. From the age of maybe five years, I've been seeing these documentaries on these wonderful, crazy, beautiful birds that are in Australia and these wonderful animals that I can only see at the zoo. And every time I see this, I say, I've got to go to Australia. So someday, I hope to be there. Someday, I'm going to take that a very, very long travel to Australia. I hear that the airplane trip over to Australia is extremely long, but I think it would be worth it because I have to go to Australia. Mr. Table Topic. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Now, skiing has the rare distinction of being a sport that you can do in both the summer and the winter. Now, I'm not talking about Dubai here. What I'm talking about is winter snow skiing and summer water skiing. I'd like to introduce Sherry Snow of Silicon Valley Toasters, Toastmasters to tell us what is her favorite skiing, snow skiing or water skiing. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Fellow Toastmasters, my favorite sport is either snow skiing or water skiing. This is tough because I've done both. I started out as a water skier 
when I was seven years old and I was competitive and I moved up the ranks. I used to be a trick skier. I can single ski. I can carry a ski that's three times my size into the water and I can have my dad line up and I can yell, hit it, and off we go and I can give you a great rooster tail in water skiing. And then I use my thumb and I say up, 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 and I want to see how fast I can go. And if you know anything about water skiing, you are out like this and you're pulling back while the boat's going forward and the G's that are pulling on you can flatten your face, which is totally good because this is a real big rush. And then you lean back even further and then just when you can't lean back anymore and you think you might be pushing the ski out from underneath you, you cut the wake and you go out as far as you can and you see if you can get ahead of the boat and then you slow back down because your dad's going faster. He keeps pushing it up, so you slow back down. And then he swings you around and you go out the other side. So that's water skiing. It's great. It's fun. And if you have never done it, you need to try it. Snow skiing I took up as an adult and I did a rope tow. And that also has a lot of force on your arms. And if you have ever gone or done a rope tow, you would know that you need to have really strong upper body strength for snow skiing, but my favorite is water skiing. Mr. Table Topics Master. Thank you, Sarah. Now, I love vacations, but I think everybody here will admit there's always something that you don't like about the vacation. For some people, it's the air travel. For me, I think back to one vacation I took with my father, who was a medieval history professor, and we were going to five cathedrals a day as we were going through Europe. I mean, I didn't even know there was five cathedrals in Paris, and here we are going from one to the next to the next to the next. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Ayu Bor, also from Silicon San Jose Toastmasters, and I'd like Ayu Bor to tell us what is her least favorite part of vacations, and how would she replace that part of the vacation? Mr. Toastmaster and fellow Toastmasters and most distinguished guests, what is my least favorite things during my vacation? In fact, I love flying. I love everything that makes me feel like flying. So that is not an issue. I could take up to 13, 14 hours flight to China or Korea or to Mongolia. I could change planes twice. That's not a problem for me. What is least favorite is language barrier. And I want to speak them all. I love learning languages. And I hate when I am in the country and I can't communicate with the residents. And, then, and that happened to me in China. I'm from Mongolia. I, I'm right next to China borders with them, but I do not speak the language. I do not speak Mandarin. And it was very hard for me because there are not many people in China who speak English. And it may come surprising, although that, that is the truth. So I'd love to learn Spanish, Mandarin, and my um, next, the next language on my list is, I think, um, French. Although I think I can learn Spanish, I, don't, I do not think I could catch up the Mandarin uh, kanji letters. Thank you so much. Now everybody has his or, own, his or her own vacation style. Some people like to do guided tours and have it all laid out. People like me I'd rather just get the plane ticket, put me on the ground, I'll figure it out from there. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Doug Weller, from San Jose Toastmasters, to tell us what is his vacation style. Boy, Mr. Toastmaster, uh, fellow Toastmasters, uh, distinguished guests, 
What is my vacation style? Boy, that is a good question. I have a lot of different styles. I certainly am not one to sit on a tour bus. I've done it before, and you sit all day on the tour bus, and you walk, you listen, and then you go out when the tours go, and I guess that is not my style. Uh, one of my styles is, is getting in trouble. I went on a tour to Russia once, and we were on that tour bus, and we were driving around, and so my thing in Russia was, Every statue, this is in 1985, Gorbachev was in power, and my goal was to climb up any statue or um, emblem and get a picture up there with, with the, the people. Now, unfortunately, the people in Russia were very, very serious about it. And there was one war memorial where I was, or one this great war memorial, you know, getting ready for the picture, and my in-tourist guide walked the corner, and her face went ashen white because she knew if one of the guards saw me that I would rapidly be... Uh, in prison, and she didn't want to lose one of her tourist hosts. And so anyway, so I climbed down, and then one time, I remember we were in Leningrad, it was Leningrad at that time, and I'm going, and I see a giant statue of Lenin, I'd like nothing better than to be on the shoulder of Lenin with a picture. So I'm, I'm running towards it, but out of the corner of my eye, I see another guard come running, at, and he's yelling, Niet! And so I kind of <laughs> do a little turn and kind of look for my intour guy, because actually they, those times the in-tourist guy were connected with the KGB and so they were some type of, of safety there. And so anyways, after a while, some of the people on the tour got in the act, so anytime I began to do something, they'd yell out, yet, yet, and they'd stop me and, and try to embarrass me. But uh, anyways, as I go down different types of, of, of uh, entertainment, um, of, of vacations, I look for different styles, and, and that was my Russian style. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much. Now for our last, but most definitely not least speaker, I have a very special topic. So we're all familiar with the traditional triathlon. You start with swimming, then you ride a bike, then you go to running. My ideal summer triathlon is surfing, followed by a nap on the beach, followed by a nice lunch at a taco stand. I'd like to invite up Marika Kark of Toasters R Us to tell us what is her ideal triathlon. <laughs> Thank you, Will. My ideal triathlon actually is the July Avatar course, and, I, and I'll tell you why it's a triathlon. You've got a thousand people in that room, and you have some students that you're responsible for. The triathlon starts early in the morning at about 6.30. Actually, you go swimming before that. Then at 6.30, then the students come at 9. Then we've got lunch at, at about 12.30. And then people come back at 2 and we're going, we're moving. We're moving till 7. And towards the end of the week, we're moving towards 8. So that's 120 hours in nine days for the Avatar Masters. And eight-hour days for the students, which is great. But what makes it a fabulous triathlon and very challenging is that you get to see people coming in pretty grumpy at the beginning of this, and they go out and they're literally flying. And so you feel, you feel incredibly awesome. The way you feel when you come back over the waves, the way you feel when you're, when you're surfing those long rollers they surf in Australia. The way you feel when you learn a new language and you watch someone's face light up. The Russian, spasibo, means thank you in Russian. To see a Russian face light up, light up that's been pretty grumpy, ugh, to all of a sudden go, <laughs> is, is the best. That's when, like moguls, that you ski, when you ski down moguls and they're like a washboard and you're going, <laughs> it's like that. It's that speed and that fascination and that challenge, that makes a triathlon, and that makes it worth it. Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> You're welcome. So this concludes our table topic session. Let's have a big round of applause for all of our speakers today. So we'll now move on to the next part of today's meeting. We'll watch a short vignette on our featured club, Redwood Orators. I'm a member of Redwood City Orators and we meet at 7 a.m. on Friday mornings. 
Well, our club does have a theme and it's called Dare to Speak at 7 a.m. So we dare people to come and speak at 7 a.m. And the fact that we meet at 7 a.m. in the morning is, for me, a, a really helpful thing because it means that it never conflicts with my day. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. Good morning. Welcome to our meeting this morning. Well, there are many different club cultures, and before I decided on taking up Redwood City Orators, I had actually visited several other clubs to see how their culture fit in with me, whether it was the time, the location, the group of people, the type of camaraderie that they had. That was important for me. This is a community club as opposed to a business club, so therefore the topics are much broader. Uh, Sarah Palin recently finished her book, and she entitled it Going Rogue, An American Life. Now, why do you suppose she chose that particular title for her book? I love this. It, it's like family here. Well, I certainly think that we are free to choose topics that might be considered sensitive in other environments. But because we know each other well, we feel free to express those kinds of things without concern about criticism. We also thought that the world only was around for 4,000, 6,000 years, not long at all. And it was created for us. Our second speaker this morning is David Ammon. And this is a non-manual speech, David? As is the rule of our club, if you do have a non-manual speech, it is up to the evaluator to decide what you're going to be meeting as an objective. I got fed up one time with people who were just doing non-manual speeches. So I decided at the last minute when I was an evaluator for somebody, I thought, okay. And so I stood up and I said, well, so-and-so is going to be giving a speech today and I'm their evaluator and these are their objectives. And before I knew it, everybody else who had to evaluate a non-manual speech started following what I had already decided to do. So it's become a club tradition. And what that has done is has actually brought people back into using manual speeches. I was dating a lady and she was a member and we were you know, going out together and she said, I'm going to Toastmasters and you're coming. I didn't have much choice in that. Well, I had decided finally to start my business again and realized that I needed to A, have an outlet that was helping me focus on presenting my business to improve my presentations and then also to keep me busy. So I decided, well, let's try Toastmasters. Uh, my wife Carmel had been with the club for about a year and she suggested that I join and it seemed like a good idea and so I just went ahead and, and joined Toastmasters at that point and I have never looked back. I really, really enjoyed this experience. Congratulations for the best answer to I, that question. Of by the way, I did marry her and she's now my wife. Welcome back everybody. It is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce a very experienced Toastmaster and my dear friend, Peter Kark, to give his advanced speech, Salmon Fishing. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster fellow Toastmasters, and honorable guests. Life is about challenges. I knew that as a boy, but I forgot it as I grew up, and I had to learn it again as an adult. My father was an adventurer who'd fished in many oceans, in fact, almost every ocean in the world. Mother had died, and in the following two years, he dwindled in his nursing home in Seattle. His speech and memory became less. His stories hardly came out. And it took him great effort and a lot of time to move around in his walker. Still, he wanted to go fishing for his 89th birthday. I hated fishing. I flew to Seattle and took him in a ferry to Vancouver, British Columbia. He waited for all the other passengers to get off, and then he hobbled very slowly off the boat and onto the dock. And somehow we made it to the hotel. That night I found I had to cut up his food and actually feed him forkfuls one at a time. The next morning it took him two hours to get dressed, and half an hour just to cross the street to get to breakfast. While he was eating, I ran down the dock and went to the fishing boat. 
Adam, I said to the captain, I'm sorry we're going to be late. He's very slow. But all it needs is taking him out in the boat and letting him drop a line over and play with it a little bit. Even if it's just half an hour, we'll, we'll pay for it. That's not it, said Adam. I'm not worried about that. But we've only got till 1230, and I want to be sure he catches some fish. Eh? Well, that's very kind, I said, but even if it's only half an hour, we'll gladly pay for it. Father moved along the dock, and we got him to sit on the edge of the boat and helped him get his legs in and half carried him into the fishing chair. And there he sat in a windbreaker too big for him, a baseball cap covering his bald head, looking kind of dazed, and kind of expectant, no longer the professor of medicine or the brigadier general who had terrified his sons, his junior officers, and his students for decades. Adam took us out in a light drizzle and gentle swells to the fishing ground. When we got there, he pointed out See those fishing birds? They're ocelots. They're diving down to eat needlefish. That's the same fish the salmon eat, the salmon eat, eh? Now's the time to get going. He threaded the hooks, put on the bait, dropped it down, and we played with the lines. My father played with the line. And then suddenly his pole bent half a foot, a strike. He leapt up. He leapt up with a fire in his eyes. He spread his feet. He bent his, uh, his knees so he could catch the swells. Pulled to jerk the fish and, and, and catch the hook. And Adam gave another tug on it. And my father said, leave me be. I'll catch you myself. Out the, the salmon pulled the line. It went roaring out. And the handle of the reel wrapped my father's knuckles until he swore. And then the pole straightened, and my father reeled in and reeled in as fast as he could. In and out, in and out. And my father getting shorter of breath and more excited every time. Then the fish leaped out of the water, a great silver thing crashing and splashing on the sea. I was so excited, I could hardly believe it. Can I help you, I said to my father as his breath got short. No, I'll catch him myself. Thank you. And still he reeled in, every in a little more, every out a little less. And finally, Adam sweeped him up and flopped him in the boat, knocked him out. Eight or nine pounds, a great catch. I caught a, ca I caught a catch a little while later. Boy, it hurt the arms, but I couldn't not bring it in with my father there. Twenty minutes of fighting, and I mean fighting. Ten or twelve pounds, we went back to the dock. Why don't you take the walker, my father said. I can go up the steps and stride along better without it. And so he did. He needed that challenge. And for the rest of his life, he remained excited and going until he died in his sleep two years later. So for you. Keep challenges in your life. Find some that will keep you and keep your life alive. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Peter. A very heartwarming story about your father. Now, for our next section, I would like to invite our evaluator to, uh, actually, we're good on the interview. It's, uh, yeah. It ran over, so. Go ahead, <laughs> So I'd now like to invite up our evaluator, Han Chow, to provide an evaluation of Peter's speech. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and especially to our guest speaker. Peter, wow, I thought that you did an excellent job. You gave a speech about your father, and you shared a story that you have a very close relationship with him, and you have been with him the day he passed away. So it's very heartfelt, and I felt that too. I know that when my grandmother had passed away, I felt that, so I can identify that with you. You were very animated. You used a lot of hand gestures. When you talk about the fishing pole, you use that. However, I would like for you to really have a visual aid. Maybe bring that, that fish pole, demonstrate that, so that create more impact, more convincing to the audience. And you can also perhaps use this stage 
as a scene, maybe create a, a time, a place, or plot that way when how you had that fishing moment with your father. So it create more of a, I guess, powerful impact to the audience. Also, well, for you to really pause, I feel that you have a lot of information to share with the audience, but I feel it was ongoing, ongoing and it didn't really give the audience the time to reflect. So you might want to pause so it helps the audience to really catch up. And also, you can use vocal variety. You can use a dialogue. I know that at a certain time, you have demonstrate your father's voice. And I might have seen that, but I didn't quite feel what kind of personality he was or what kind of person he was. So I didn't feel that. So maybe create that beginning. Maybe he was very grouchy when he had to go for a ride, but he did not. So I didn't quite feel that. What kind of personality? And also, I would like to see if a picture of your father. When you want to share a presentation of storytelling, talk about a person, we definitely like to see that person. And like they say, a picture paints a thousand words. And I didn't see that, and I really want to know what your father was like. So bear that in mind. And also, you could also maybe, let me see, like I said, prop. for You did everything very well. And let me just say, and keep it the good word. And we'll have to see you around. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, with that, I regret to inform you that we have come to the end of our meeting today. First of all, I'd like to give a big thank you to Han and Peter for the speech and evaluation. Those are fantastic. <laughs> a thank you to all of our table topic speakers once again. And a thank you to everyone who could be here today and everybody who's watching at home. So if you're thinking about coming to a Toastmasters meeting, you never have, or if you are a Toastmaster and you'd like to find out about coming here to be on Bay to Bay, I'd like to invite you to go to the District 4 website at d4tm.org. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>